welcome Amir Chowdhury with Unikernels. What are they good for? Hi, folks. All right, so I will be talking about Unikernels and going over a history, a brief history as to how we got here. And the first thing I want to do is call out all the open source effort. So everything I'm going to talk about is all open source software. A lot of it's all, all available on GitHub. And I'm, I'd like to thank all the people who've contributed to this code, because it's because of them that any of us can go around giving talks about this. So thank you for open source. So very quickly about me. Uh, my name is Amir Chowdhury. I work for Docker in England. So Docker does have an office in Cambridge, UK. That's my Twitter handle. So if you have questions for me that I don't get to now, you can tweet me and we can discuss it later. So I'll start off by giving some background as to my view as to where um, we've got to today in terms of software. And I do this to try and frame why Unikernels happened. So a lot of this is probably going to be familiar to many of you. So if we think of software, it's an application which consists of a runtime, a bunch of binaries, a configuration of that stuff. And we sit all of that on top of an operating system. And the operating system provides a bunch of things to help, to help make all this possible. Now, the application sometimes makes assumptions about what's underneath it. And I'm talking about traditional operating systems here. So there isn't necessarily a clean separation. So I'll be using this figure as a guide at various points during this talk. But another way of thinking about the kind of thing I'm describing in terms of what the application needs from the OS uh, can be seen here. So if that's my application sitting on the top, how much of the stuff underneath do you think it actually uses? From, for any given application, it's not as much as you may think. So that application may use some aspects of some of the libraries, some of the pieces that are available in the OS. And that doesn't even include all the things that a normal traditional operating system provides you, things like shell acts, uh, a shell or all the drivers that are in there. And all those things are extra things, part of the operating system that you, your application code may not actually need. And another way of thinking about that is at the top here, this is, there's an iceberg. So at the top here, there's the code you actually care about. That's your, your business logic. That's your value. That's where you actually make your money. The stuff underneath is the, thing, or is the operating system that contains all the stuff that it insists you must have, because that's just how the operating systems were constructed. And moreover, when we actually write software, we build it locally on machines like this. But we then want to deploy it far, far away on machines like this. And there's already a difference between these two types of environments. They're not the same. So the thing that I build here, I then have to figure out why it's not working somewhere over there. And this is about to get even more complicated. Has anyone heard Internet of Things buzzword? So we're going to be deploying software even more remotely than we do today. And this is not going to be just things like thermostats, toasters, fridges that are connected to the Internet. It's going to be way more involved than that. So if you look at that little figure on the bottom right, on the bottom right there, at the bottom, that's an insulin pump that's connected to the Internet and, an, and a smartphone app. Next to that, just to the top left of it, is a pacemaker, also connected to the Internet. Now, if that doesn't give you pause for thought about how we build, ship, and run software, I don't know what else will. So overall, software today has become complex. Even though most of the applications that we build and ship are single purpose, especially when you consider this era of microservices, when you're deploying things to the cloud where it just has that one job, it just has one thing it needs to do. So complexity here for those kinds of services, that's the enemy. The more pieces you have, the more tricky it is to configure all those pieces to work together. The more duplication there is, the more inefficiency there is. So for example, if you think of the idea of deploying virtual machines, each of which contains its OS, but its single purpose application on top, that's a lot of, a lot of unnecessary duplication. And because these things can be quite large, there's a lot of inertia in the system. The, the boot times can be slower. It's just more, more effort to move things around. And generally speaking, um, the more stuff you have, the larger the attack surface is. Now, I've said complexity is the enemy, but it kind of depends. Complexity is kind of relative. It's relative to the thing you're actually trying to achieve. It does, it's not necessarily the case that just having more stuff is more complex or having less stuff is simpler. It just depends on what you're actually trying to get to. Another way of thinking about it is the right tool for the job. So to try and make an analogy between software and the real world, uh, these are all methods of transportation, transporting people, transporting stuff. And there are many, many different ways of doing that. Car, planes, trains, automobiles, each of these is useful for a different purpose. And they all make different trade-offs. You wouldn't necessarily take an F1 car to drop your kids off at school. But likewise, you wouldn't necessarily take a little smart car on a cross-country road trip. You could. But it's not necessarily the right tool for the job. And so people build different ways of transporting things, transporting people and goods, because they have different trade-offs, different constraints, and so they optimize for those. 
And we actually need more options like this in the software world. More ways for developers to pick and choose what they pick and choose for their constraints. Essentially, we need more diversity out there in the way we build, ship, and run our software. And things are getting easier. So Docker come along, obviously I work at Docker. Um, they've changed the unit of deployment. So, to, so instead of having to deploy a large virtual machine, you now deploy a container on top of a shared kernel. That makes things uh, much, much easier, and there's more consistency now between what happens on a developer machine and on a production machine. And just in case you weren't aware, Docker also provides something called uh, containers as a service, as a platform. And this kind of sits in between infrastructure as a service, which is sometimes quite low-level stuff, and a platform as a service, which is sometimes a little too opinionated. And if you've ever worked with opinionated software, it's wonderful when your opinions match your own. It's real pain when, they, when those opinions don't. So containers as a service tries to sit in between the two of them so you can bake your own opinions into the way you want to deploy things. So it's trying to aim for that little sweet spot. So this is all well and good, but what if you took an extreme view? What if you went back and said, this is the world we live in. We're trying to deploy software to this world. What should we do if we want to do it from scratch, if we want to uh, take a fresh view of this? So first thing you, uh, that would be useful to do is to disentangle applications from the operating system. So that, that stack I described before, your, your application typically makes assumptions about what's underneath it. If we can disentangle that, that then allows us to break up the operating system functionality into modular reusable components. And then when, you're, when you've done that, you can take your application code and link it against only the system functionality, only the separate components of that OS that your application actually needs to run. And you can ignore the rest. So you exclude all the things that your application doesn't need. And once you've been able to do that and you have this collection of modular components, you should then be able to retarget your application to work on different platforms from, from the single code base. So without changing your application code, you should be able to deploy it to multiple different environments. And of course, this is where unikernels come in. So what are unikernels? Well, there's a Wikipedia page, which means we're legit. And the description you'll find is unikernels are built using a modular stack. Every application is compiled into its own specialized OS, and you target that for the cloud or embedded devices. So these, these images that are produced are single address space images. They only contain the thing that you told them to do and nothing else. So there is no other extraneous code in there other than what you've explicitly put into it. Another way of trying to think about that is the model of just enough OS for your specific application. Now, when I say just enough OS, I don't mean that there's a separation between the operating system and the, your application on top of it. It's all one thing. You've pulled in all the libraries, so it's one single address space image. And this is really useful. This is highly applicable to things like microservices. Because if you've got a piece of software that just does one job, Unikernels seem like a useful approach to that. It also lends itself to the idea of immutable infrastructure. Because once you've built these images, and they're relatively quick to build, as I hope I'll show you soon, you can then deploy them. And then if you want to roll back, you just roll back to a previous version, or replace the new version with a different, different one that you've just built. So you don't actually have to reach into the machine, into this um, Unikernel, to change anything. You just build a new one. So hopefully you can see that this, is, this has really close links, really applicable to things like microservices and in the future to the area of Internet of Things. At this point, it's usually worth talking about unikernels and Docker. So essentially, where do unikernels and containers sit? So sometime around summer last year and towards the end of last year, there was lots of discussion online about unikernels versus containers and they should get into a room, have a big punch up, and one of them should win. <laughs> Not very useful. but. Unikernels and containers actually sit on a continuum because, as I mentioned earlier, you want there to be more diversity in the ecosystem for people to be able to choose how they want to deploy their software. And you can think of unikernels as sitting on a continuum where they're the extreme end of specialization. They're at the extreme end of the isolation. So you can think of traditional operating system on one hand, a shared kernel with containers on top, and far, far away on one extreme is unikernels, where essentially you've taken it to, to an extreme where everything is baked into, the, baked into that image and nothing else. And if you think of things like Alpine Linux, that might give you an idea of like this progression that we're seeing of stripping down, taking things away that you don't need, so you're just getting the bare stuff, and then adding things back as and when you need them. And this essentially gives developers this, this continuum, the wider we can expand this continuum, the more choice developers have about where they want to, put, where they want to sit on this on an application by application basis. So, unikernels themselves, 
There are a lot of them. So these are different unikernel projects. And there are about 10 or so, last time I checked, there are more now that are related to unikernels in terms of deploying them. And people have described this as a unikernel zoo. Each of these is at various stages of development. They all have their own different ways of building them. They all have their different tool chains. It's, it's a smorgasbord of stuff. But we can break it down and consider it as two broad approaches. One category of Unicorn Project considers legacy. In other words, what have we already got that we can reuse, that we can break up, and then deal with legacy software? The other alternative approach is to say, just step back and say, what if we did this from scratch? Let's go clean slate, right back to the drawing board, build the things up as we need them for the modern era. And the legacy approach exists. So Rump Kernels is one of the projects that takes the NetBSD stack and makes the components available as user land libraries. And there's also work going on in Linux, so which I thought that'd be interesting for you guys to know about, Linux Kernel Library, which is essentially trying to do the same thing with the Linux stack, making, the, making it much, much easier to reuse the code that's gone into the Linux kernel. And the alternative is the clean slate approach. Now the clean slate approach typically ends up becoming language specific. So you end up benefiting from the features of that language by writing application code in that language, writing all the libraries in that language from scratch, and then compiling all that down using the language toolchain, perhaps with some modifications. So Mirage OS is written in a camel, uh, HalVM is Haskell, and Include OS is C++. So all of these projects have built various, various parts of the OS stack, like for example networking, in the, in the language that you would then write your application in. And you get to benefit from certain things when you go clean slate. So you do have to rewrite the libraries, which is a lot of work, and no one generally thanks you for it until it's done. And you can forget POSIX. You can ignore all the legacy stuff that's existed that sometimes gets annoying to work with. You also start to benefit from OS-specific features like package management. So you get to leverage all the things that already exist with a particular language to help, to help with the um, building of your unikernels. So I'm going to talk about one of these in a little bit more detail and give you a demo using one of them. And that one is Mirage OS, where the language is written in OCaml. Has there anyone heard of OCaml? OK. And so Mirage OS took essentially this stack and rewrote a whole bunch of libraries. So there's a bunch of people sitting in a room writing libraries, wondering why they were doing this. So what's been done is there are now over 100 libraries, uh, perhaps more now, uh, written in pure OCaml, which represent uh, parts of the operating system. So a networking stack, and there's a web server, a whole bunch of libraries out there that essentially represent the things that you see on the bottom half of the left-hand side. And the Mirage toolchain essentially combines that with your application code to produce a unikernel. But you target that unikernel to different environments. And so in this example, it's targeting Unix. So you can use a Mirage toolchain and then build your image so it runs as a Unix process. And that's actually very handy for you to just build and debug what's going on. Build and actually understand what's going on with your application. Make sure that you can do it this way. But you can then also retarget that. So take the same application code, as long as it's not making assumptions about what's underneath, as long as it's pure OCaml, you can then retarget that to different environments. So in this example, you can target Zen on x86 hardware. You can also target Zen on Harm ARM hardware. And there's also a bunch of other projects that give other different backends. And we're also working one for KVM, which is not represented here. So the only thing you need to do to make this possible is to write those system libraries. But once you've taken the time to write those system libraries for these different backends, they're, re they're usable by anyone. You then, there's a multiplier effect once those exist. But the key point about this for, for Mirage is you have a familiar development cycle. So if you're in a Camel programmer, you just use all the normal tools you're used to to write your code and understand what's going on. That's just how you do it. But then you get to deploy your code as a unikernel in multiple different environments. So broadly speaking, your normal tools apply. This is important to realize. When you're building, to building things this way, everything you did before, you still continue to do. But you start to target different places. So you, can, you just swap the system libraries out, and the toolchain will do that for you. So what I'd like to show you is a demonstration. I hope this works. I'm going to build on my Mac um, a unikernel. I'm going to deploy that to an IoT device, which is this device here, which is a cubbyboard. So this is an ARM device, and I'm going to build an image on this machine and deploy it to over there. So I'm going to build that image in a Linux container. 
to show you that it works. I'll then run it from that Linux container so you can actually see what it is. I will then retarget that without changing the application code for the ARM backend. And then I'll move that binary over to this device and then I'll turn it on. Does that make sense? Good. That's correct. And the specific demo, this is a cubby board, cubby board two. So the specific demo I'm going to show you is the 2048 game. So this game was written in OCaml. It's kind of fun to look at. And I'll be doing this demo using Docker for Mac. So all the stuff I'll do with Linux containers, I'll be using the, the Docker tools for that. And because I'm going to have a ridiculous number of terminal windows open, this is more than I normally like for a demo, I've tried to make it easy for you to see what's going on. So for the terminals where you see the OS X in the back, image in the background, that's I'm on my machine. For the ones where you see the uh, Linux Penguin and Docker for Mac, I'm in the container. The one where you see the ARM, the ARM logo, I'm in the ARM container. So the ARM container is important because that's not um, cross-compilation, that's actually the ARM image. And then the cubby board will be when I'm SSH into this. So hopefully that will make sense. So, so let's see where I am. So I have, can you read that? Good. So I'm on my local machine here. Okay, let's check. So I'm on my Mac OS X. And what I have here is a clone of a repo that has all the necessary code to run that application. So what I'm going to do is firstly, I'm going to build that in a container image. So I'm going to go to a container. Ah, lost my mouse. And I pre-built some container images to make sure this demo doesn't take too long. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to docker run a container. I'm sorting out the ports so that it can connect to the rest of the stuff on my Mac. And and I'm just logging with the batch. That works, good. So far, so good. And see where we are. Okay, that all looks good. And I did cheat here. I cloned that repo into this container just so that I don't have to mount my local one. So I'm going to go into that directory. So this is all the code. This is the code that is necessary, a bunch of this that is necessary for building this image. Actually, there's a bunch of stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there, but don't worry about that. So what I'm going to do now, a couple of things I need to do. That. And I'm going to now configure this. I'm going to use the Mirage configure tool. Could you still read that? Okay, so what I'm doing here is Mirage is the tool that I'm using to actually build this unikernel, and the configure step is where I tell it what parameters I'm going to pass to this, pass into the tool. So I want to build for the Unix stack, and I want to use the socket stack. So what Mirage tool will go off and do now is check what other libraries it may need, given that I've constrained it to be running on Unix, and then it will go download stuff that it may need. It will also then, it also, it's also able to go and get external dependencies as well. Now, I told you I cheated, because I built this already, so all of these packages are already installed. If you were doing this using the normal images, which exist, it would now go off and install all, each of those. So you'd end up with all these libraries which are necessary for doing the build. Now all we do is run make. So what, what is happening is the normal compiler, a camel compiler toolchain is, is taking over, and it's built that image, so it's built uh, mir dash www. What I'm now going to do is run that. Okay, so that is now running in the container. I've sorted out the port so I can look at it using my normal browser. Where is my browser? Okay. And I should, fingers crossed, demigods. That's not good. <laughs> I can't actually read what's there either. Oh, that's why it's not supposed to be 8080. Yay! Okay. <laughs> so this is the 2048 game, and I'm gonna try not to get too distracted now. <laughs> so this is running in the container, and we're seeing it from the outside, and I've built this, built this using the Unix backend of Mirage. 
So this works, but that's kind of cool, but that's not really the end goal. We want to get stuff running on here. So, pardon? Yes, uh, the make file is actually generated. So the, the file you'd actually want to see over here, is, let me finish this, is the uh, config ML file, because that's the one that, def that tells the Mirage tool what's going on. So the make file is actually auto-generated, so if I, it should actually tell you at the top that this is auto-generated. Well, um, I can point you at the repo and it will, it will tell you that this is an auto-generated file. Okay. So we've built it in the unit container. That's all well and good. Now let's go build it in an ARM container so we can get an image that will run on this architecture over here. So this is now where I get to uh, worry about how many, yeah. So now I'm going to run a different container image. Again, I cheated. Made one in advance. So what I'm doing here is I'm now, that's not gonna work because I'm not in the right directory. Because what I want to do is mount my local directory into that container image. So where am I? That's not right. Glad I spotted that. That could have been really embarrassing. There we go. Okay. Mm, that's quite messy. I've been playing around with this earlier. But it will all still work. So I'm now going to mount this in here. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to run a different image. Um, I'm not going to mess with any ports because I'm just doing the build in here. And I'm mounting this local directory, which is on my, on my OSX machine, into that container image. So anything that then gets built is going to be in my local environment here. Okay, so let's see where we are. So this is, I type and mistype that. Okay, so that's where we, that's the, the container image that we're in. So I'm again going to run the eval opam config because I should have baked that into the image, but I forgot to. All right, and now I mounted this at SRC. So I'm going to go straight to SRC and we should be able to see this is the stuff that was on my local drive. So this is mounted in here. So I'm actually going to clean this up before I do any more. Okay, that should have helped a little bit. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the configure step again, but this time in the configure step, I'm actually going to target the Zen backend. Here's what that command is going to look like. So I'm targeting the Zen backend. I'm also telling it that it's going to get this IP, IP address using DHCP. And those extra two commands in there because I'm overriding some of the stuff that's uh, in the normal config ML file. And the no OPAM thing at the end, OPAM is the uh, camel package manager. I'm actually telling it not to go off and do those extra checks to see what packages it needs because I know that those packages are already in here. So I'm doing that to just go through this a little bit quicker. So what will happen now is it will generate all those files that are necessary. So it will generate the make file. We can, that's done so we can have another look. So it generated a bunch of files. And now, just like before, we just run make. So what's happening now is um, all the packages are already installed and it's now building the image. And it's not cross compilation it's building the image for the, ARM, for the ARM architecture. And this typically takes about 30 seconds. Oh, I was worried I'd have to ad lib then. So it's built. And so we've got the files there and this all works. So what we need to do now is get that built image from there onto this device. So now let's go back, to, so let's leave this here. We'll go back to, just to keep it simple. This is the directory that was mounted. And we're going to copy that myriadubdubdub.zen file onto this device. So copy it into the, so this device is already turned on and running. 
And this is devices running uh, Zen on ARM. Go. Your password. All right, so it's copied it over. So now let's actually go and look at that, at what's on that board, just to keep you, keep you aware of where we're going to be. So we're going to go SSH. So I'm gonna copy paste it because I'm gonna typo it from this far away. Okay. There we are. And we can see what we have here. So there's the thing I copied over. That extra file, arm demo XL, is another file is, which um, tells Zen what to do. So it contains a little bit of information for what Zen needs. So that's what it looks like. It essentially tells it where the image is and what it's supposed to do. So now all we have to do is tell Zen to run that image. It doesn't have to do anything else. It's got the XL file which defines what it's supposed to do with it, and then you just turn it on. And that's on this device. I happen to be connected over here. So let's this. And the command we're using is sudo xl create, and it's going to get the IP address for that unikernel as from the TCP server. And oh, wait, that's because I used the wrong. Yeah, that's the one I need to do. There we go. So that unikernel is now running on this little device here. And I'm going to try and get this IP address. Now I'm going to go back to my browser window. So just to show you that this is now gone because that container should be stopped. Okay. And we're going to go to the IP address. This is now port 8080. So that image that you see there is now running from this board. And we just, so that, and that, no changes were needed to the application code itself. Because that application was written in Pura Camel. I kind of cheated because it's actually compiled to JavaScript already. So this is a, a tutorial that we did um, a year ago to help people learn how to do a Camel to JavaScript. So what you're actually seeing here is a static site. But what I've shown you is generally applicable. So if you're writing Pura Camel code, the workflow that I've showed you is exactly the same. Get distracted with this. So. So that's a demonstration of us being able to do use Mirage to build applications that you can use on Unix to try them out and then actually retarget them where the system libraries just get swapped out and then deploy them onto an IoT style device. So let's go back to here. A reminder of what we did. Built and ran an app in a Linux container on this machine that was using Docker for Mac. So I didn't have to do any of the crazy stuff with Docker machine or have VirtualBox installed, none of that stuff. The container image is just there. It's very quick to get into. It's just very convenient workflow. I then built that app. I then retargeted, retargeted it using the same um, code base. Didn't change anything. And then I was able to deploy that artifact onto an ARM-based device. So didn't go wrong. I'm very pleased. So just a recap of what Unikernels actually are. They are highly specialized. That you only, you, they can only do the thing that you told them to do. So this, this is not a general purpose operating system. It's not trying to replace a general purpose operating system. It's very, very, it helps you build very, very specific services. They live on a continuum with containers. So you want to be able to choose where you want to, an application to be on a given spectrum. You can deploy these to ARM devices, which is great. And everything is a library. So all the stuff, all the, the packages that were being pulled down, they're all libraries. And there's many, many benefits to, once you, to having all these libraries. Once you've built them all, once you've actually got them, you can reuse them. That's one of the really useful things you can do with these things that we call library operating systems. I haven't mentioned that term yet, but that's a general term for what these projects are, library operating systems. Unikernels are the things that are constructed. Sometimes that distinction doesn't get across in blogs and tweets. Now, the deployments I showed you, they're stable. We've got unikernels up and running that are very stable, but the um, the build is kind of tricky. Each of these different projects has their own way of building them, and you kind of have to get your, wrap your head around them. So, for example, the, the question about the make file. Well, that's generated. Most people may not realize that. But there are lots of deployments out there. So uh, people have built Unikernel REST APIs, Unikernel firewalls that actually work with Cubes OS. Many people have written, um, have built static websites because it's a straightforward, low-risk way of exploring. And there are also products now, commercially available products, that are built using unikernels. Cyberchaff here is 
uh, using unikernels to help detect network intrusions. So they essentially scatter a whole bunch of unikernels onto a network, and those unikernels look like services. They may look like a vulnerable version of Nginx or a vulnerable version of some other service, but they're not really, they're just unikernels. There's nothing in them. And when a network is, when a network intrusion takes place, the next step is to figure out what thing should I attack next? What should I try and make a connection to? So if a connection is made to one of these things, it doesn't have a job. Anyone who's really on the network doing proper work would have no need to connect to these. So if something, someone else is connected to them or trying to connect to them, then that can alert the network, network operator that an intrusion is actually in progress. And then they can take whatever action they deem necessary. And this is possible because of unikernels. So because these are small, simple devices, they don't need any maintenance. Once they're deployed, you can basically, these things, once they're deployed, you basically leave them alone. So CyberChap is a really, really interesting project, and it demonstrates one of the things, one of the ways that unikernels can do, the, one of the use cases where unikernels could do this, but you couldn't really achieve this using a traditional stack. For, so for example, this is not quite a honeypot. So this is why um, the project's called CyberChap. It's like, you just throw out a lot of chaff that distracts uh, an attacker. But I did mention that Libraries are really useful. So Docker for Mac uses a whole bunch of Mirage OS libraries to help make what it does possible. One of the, obviously, one of the examples in there is it uses the Mirage OS TCP stack, the networking stack, to help deal with uh, the VPN mode. So things, networking stuff going on in a container and networking stuff on the host side, there's a translation layer in between which, it, which uses the Mirage OS TCP stack. So this is what you can do once you have all these libraries, once they exist, they're suddenly valuable for, for other, types of, other types of products. And one of the other interesting things that comes about when doing this kind of work is this idea that systems programming is difficult. Sometimes people have this idea that getting into the kernel, getting deep is kind of scary, it's far away, you're not allowed to do it unless you have a really big beard, but that's not, <laughs> and so people stay away from it because they don't actually want to go there. And all the tools chains over time have diverged. People have different ways of approaching things. But really, it's just programming. It's just code. There shouldn't be anything scary under there. And unikernels, because it's all based on libraries, suddenly makes this much more accessible. So if you want to understand what's going on in a network stack, try writing a library for it. If you're not, or go look at one of the libraries that already exists. You, know, you get to see how people have implemented them, the different ways that they've approached certain problems. It's just code. And this has also uh, benefited because of a language resurgence. So people have thought about writing networking systems level stuff in Go and in Rust. And of course, we've done it for a Camel and Haskell. And library operating systems make all this stuff accessible. But of course, it's still early days. One of the problems of trying to do unikernels right now in production is you have to get your hands dirty. You have to understand, if you're using language specific ones, the particular build tool chains, the particular approaches that have been made. And if you want to, to deal with legacy software, then you have to use one of the other unicorn projects. And you have to think of all this stuff in advance. So we are trying to gather this. We are trying to make this a consistent tool chain. Ideally, it would be as easy to build and use unicorns as it is today to use containers. And that's ultimately the world we want to get to. So if you are using Docker right now, that tool chain that you're getting familiar with, it will be a very similar, if perhaps not the same kind of tool chain for unicorns. And so, Unikernel.org is one of the places where we're trying to gather this different activity. So the different projects are starting to come together to discuss things that are beneficial to all of us. For example, building, building, shipping, and running Unikernels are common things that we all need that we don't need to duplicate. So at this point, I will stop and I'll throw it open for questions. I'll say thanks for listening. So please come on up to the microphones. Anyone who's got any questions? Anybody at all? Come on up, please. I was wondering if there's any requirements on the device you're deploying to, of any software that's needed for the device you're deploying to to be running? Or, yeah. So at the moment, uh, we're using the Cubbyboard 2 as the main device that we're, that we're deploying to. So we've done a bunch of work to make sure that we can get Zen running on there properly and that the libraries all work. So at the moment, we're just targeting this particular device. So once we get things, obviously we want to expand that. So there are other people who are trying out things with Raspberry Pi and various other devices. So we need people to contribute. So, so I have a question about like the development process. So you build this uni kernel, you talk about, think about this library and um, the advantage is that it's very small, light, lightweight. But sometimes when you run into problems, then you want you know, to bring in more stuff. 
there. Now with libraries, your shared, your dynamic libraries, that you can bring them in, you know, and do this like even after the fact, and in certain, in certain dynamic li languages, right? I mean, if you're running a Perl, Ruby, whatever, uh, Python, right? You could, at runtime, you can bring in more stuff, right? And just load, what's the state of the art for? So the general, pro the general problem was just like, okay, so I want this to be lean and mean, uh, I, I don't want to have to like redeploy, and, and when I hit an error or a problem or some state that I want to find out more, you know, it's at that point I'd like to like expand my library, bring in more stuff. And so it's, it's not just about Unix kernels. I mean, you have the same problem, I guess, with Docker this, itself, containers, whatever. This is essentially, uh, uh, if that's, so yes, that's true, but then it's, a, it's, a pro, it's an approach people take. So if you want to, in this case of the example I gave, you would then have to recompile the image with the extra stuff in and then try that out and test that one. Yeah, but that's what you, you, you hit the error, right? You don't know what, you know, this is some weird, weird fluky error condition you didn't think about in some environment, you know, and it's on some slightly different environment or has some, you know, maybe it's memory based or maybe it's, you know, uh, a certain sequence of operations, right? So the name of the game in like, you know, to stop everything and then, you know, recompile and, and that also slows down development, right? You know. not, we've not necessarily experienced that it slows down the development process for us. Um, but this is an approach of having compiled compiled images. So these are all statically, a camel is statically linked. So you essentially compile, well, the way we build these unit kernels, you essentially add the things that you want and then we we build it and then try it again. So I don't really know how to answer your question. It's, well, it's, it seems it's, like it's just something describing... that it, it was more a situation and, and I guess a development style that I think would be nice, right, where when I hit an error, I can, when I hit a problem, you know, maybe, I can, I maybe can the question is, are there, is there tooling to help with that debugging scenario or with a debugging scenario and what are you working on? Would that, would that be appropriate, you think, as a question? Some of that. Well, more, more general thing is bringing in more stuff when you, when you need it. You want to be lean and mean to be fast. Okay, but when you hit an error or a problem, it, it could be both. Well, so, so during development, it, that speeds up the development time if you have to do less steps. That during during production, you know, so you, this could be in production and you hit some really fluky error and now you, you know, it, that, that's really, really hard to reproduce. So one of the now, you, now you've narrowed it down. So okay. One of the things you can also do is stop is push logs, is actually have uh, logs taking place in the unit or have those things pushed somewhere to give you information about what's going on. Um, rebuilding these things is actually not that not that time consuming, like for the for the Mirage OS and for other projects, you can attach other things. So you can use things like GDB with Rump, uh, Rumper and Unikernel. So, and that's, so and that's another issues. another approach, which is I think is in its infancy. Which okay, so you could define API. So how's GDB doing it? Well, they, it, it's or or something like that. They they defined an you know an API that works a, a REST API or something. I'm gonna I'm gonna call time on this and say I think this is something for later on. I think it's gone beyond a question and is just all. A, one final point is we do need to build more tooling. That is definitely a thing that has to happen. In the slides, you showed a photo of the operating system and all the packages it uh, provided. And then you had orange highlighting the actual execution pathways inside of those uh, library dependencies um, that your application actually used. Um, when you did an install, it showed you pulling in a bunch of dependencies, which I assume you declared somewhere saying, I need this, this, and this. When it did that compilation process, did it only compile in the uh, execution pathways, or did it take that entire shared library and just statically link at it? That, so at the moment, what's happening, because that's using the, oh, the uh, camel package manager, so any module that gets touched, the whole of that thing gets pulled in. But there are certain optimizations that are coming in a camel proper in 403 that will improve that. And ultimately, we'd also like to do more dead code elimination as well. So code that is actually not used does not get pulled in or gets cleaned out. Okay, so eventually so we, you will clear out a bunch of dead code out of these shared libraries. But right now, it's just a static compilation process. And I think Haskell, I think someone who knows Haskell better may correct me, uh, does a slightly better job of that. So the uh, Haskell HalVM images have some dead, have slightly more dead code elimination taking place just out of the bag than at the moment a camel does. But Someone please correct me if I've misstated that. Thank you. Uh, oh. Can you speak to uh, 
how happy the project is having Zen as the ultimate target for running these, uh, you know, the unikernels, and whether you feel there's pros and cons coming from that decision that happened many years ago. So we don't have just Zen as a backend. So Zen is the, the obvious target because people want to deploy onto the cloud, and places like Amazon and Rackspace use Zen. So we also want to target things like KVM, uh, various other backends. You also want to be able to build for actually embedded hardware, so pull in all the dri device drivers as well, and build a, a blob that you can then essentially flash. So it's not, we're not just doing Zen. Okay. And those are mature enough to use, or is that sort of like an aspirational it, future you guys have? Some of it is work in progress. So uh, Zen works right now because we've built and deployed images onto, onto the Zen machine. So the Mirage website, for example, um, the stuff that's on here, that's, that's stable and works. The KVM backend is being worked on at the moment. So we've had some demonstrations, but using with Mirage OS. And some of the other projects also, I think, target things like KVM. It sounds like what you're saying is uh, you're happy with it so far because those are the big hitters, but there's plenty of other use cases that you're working towards that have other deployment targets. Yeah, and it's not just because they're big hitters. It's because um, the, a lot of the people that work on Mirage OS also worked on Zen first. Right. So they know the Zen tool, they know the Zen stack inside out. So it's easier for us to fix bugs and push bu uh, fix patches, send patches upstream, which has actually happened a lot over the years. Um, you mentioned uh, the flogging, uh, but I assume the file system is just another library that's included writing to the file system and then being able to type in but force your application to write the logs directly over the net, or could you also have additional products? That's one of the things that we're actually uh, working on at the moment is how to deal with logging, because you want to capture the logs and then push them somewhere else. So that's uh, an ongoing piece of work. And there's discussions on the mailing list now about how we should do that. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm actually here with a couple of coworkers. Uh, we all have all actually deployed some Mirage OS um, unikernels um, to AWS. Um, had some success, um, also a lot of pain. Uh, <laughs> definitely uh, empathize with the, the you know, missing tooling and are looking for more. Um, something we're really optimistic for is the ability to use tooling similar to uh, the Docker tool chain. I'm just wondering if you could um, prophesize a little bit for us what that interface is going to look like or, or um, what the timeline is like um, before we can get our hands on a simpler unikernel deploy. So I can't necessarily speak to what the interfaces will look like or the timelines directly, because that's internal stuff at the moment that we're, discuss we're discussing with the team. But I can tell you that we, we want the tool chain to be as similar as possible, so that if you've lear already learned Docker, you're not going to have to learn much, much more new stuff to be able to use unikernels, ideally as little as possible. Uh, there is something you can look at, which is oh, we've already open sourced, or um, unikernel runner. So if you look at the unikernel.org website, You'll see a link to you'll see a blog post that actually links to a bunch of code, and then on the forum that's attached, so devel.unikernel.org, there's another post that describes the, the follow-on work. So Unikernel Runner is one way of Unikernel taking runner. Unikernels and then running them using Docker. Very nice, thank you. So that might give you an indication of like the kind of direction, the kind of way things are going. You can also follow the work that's taking place on the Solo Five. So that's some of those discussions are happening on the Mirage mailing list. So Solo Five is a is a project that's coming out of IBM Research. And it's, it's a different backend for Mirage. So that's how we're going to get running with QMU and KVM. Solo, S O L O 5, the number 5. Very nice, thanks. And I, I take it that by the internal nature, uh, this means there's not a way for folks to get involved at this stage. There will be once we have something to share. Wonderful. All right. So we want to develop in, in the open. Looking forward to updates. I was just curious, uh, based on one of the, I think, previous questions about dead code, uh, what do you see as the future uh, for libraries? Do you see libraries becoming single purpose uh, sort of unikernels as opposed to these sort of like, let's try to answer all the different tasks that, you know, libraries that we have now? So do you see the future of libraries becoming very, very specific? I think, of, yes, that's possible. But because it's just libraries, you can rewrite, you can write whatever you want. So people may end up writing collections of very, very single purpose libraries. And people who like that approach will then use those libraries. Other people may write slightly larger libraries that have more features in them, more, more stuff. And then people may prefer those. And one of the really useful things is once you have a collection of libraries, you just get to choose. So you end up with a, a much, much bigger ecosystem of stuff to choose from. That's what I expect will happen.
So I wanted to piggyback off the Docker question. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, right now in the uh, Docker ecosystem with the official images, we're trying to support like smaller and smaller um, images uh, around the Alpine, like specifically with the node uh, distribution, we're trying to ship uh, Alpine, um, which has been a huge bottleneck. But there's a bigger and broader issue than that, which is uh, fragmentation of argu or architecture within the Docker registry. So when I ship my Docker image on top, or like my Docker image, it's a pre-compiled binary that is specifically for AMD64. And if I hand that to my friend who's running something else, it doesn't run there. Um, Unikernel seemed to be a way of addressing that, but in your image, it showed that Unikernel, like the Unikernel was deployed and then the Docker um, container was deployed on top of that. Is that the way it's always going to be going forward? Um, or is this oh. a way we can provide a, uh, I guess the way we can provide a Docker container that actually truly does containerize an application and actually can be recompiled textures um, ad hoc. There may be a bit of confusion about what I showed in the demo. So what did you think I did? So in the demonstration, it looked like you shipped a unikernel with a Docker image or container running on top of it from one of the slides. Oh, that the I, yeah. That was the build environment. Yeah, so so the, Docker didn't actually ship, it wasn't shipped to Docker on the ARM device. So. Okay, that was I just copied it over, SCP. I just copied it over to this device, which is running Zen. So you shipped a compiled binary? Yes, then. exactly. Okay. Um, so one of the okay. things we need to get to is the, uh, the ability to run unikernels using Docker. So that's uh, something I mentioned earlier, so the unikernel runner work. I didn't actually, dem didn't actually demo that now. Okay. I didn't demo, I did not demo that, but that, that uh, work exists. So regarding your other question, I don't think I can answer it here, but I'm happy to chat about it afterwards. Sounds good, thank you. Is there a kind of worldview for unikernels in terms of what operating systems you're expecting to provide, or do you see it more like being an ESXi type thing where you just get a sockets and something, or is it more like something that would work in conjunction with like running on a, on a normal Linux style box with other applications? So you're talking about what about unikernels? Yeah, unikernels. So unikernels are essentially a collection of libraries. So it's not necessarily, it's not quite an operating system in a sense. So we use the term operating system to, because that's essentially what it helps represent. But when you have a collection of libraries, you're then compiling a, an, an image for a certain target. And the target that I showed today is basically Zen. So Zen is a, is a stable thing. So there isn't any Linux stuff in that built image. It was all a camel code. Um, but uh, so do you see it, do you see operating, the end goal of, op, of Unikernel running on, on like an, like a very, like a core OS or, or or a very stripped down operating system, or do you see Linux? So ultimately I see being, us being able to target Unikernels such that they run on embedded devices. So that wouldn't necessarily be on an operating system, so it would be on, on an actual device. And also being able to run as a container, or in a container, or somehow in the Docker ecosystem. So I think those are the two main things I would, I would be imagining would happen. Yeah, so my my bigger question around all of this is that you, you mentioned a couple of cases where you found unikernels to be well suited. Uh, if I was going to go through them again, it would be for targeting uh, small devices, like being able to actually ship, ship a kernel on top of hardware eventually, that or ship code that, that factors away the necessity for running a separate operating system and kernel underneath it. Another was uh, security devices that could perhaps emulate something with a vulnerability, so a honeypot. But I feel like at the same time, there's a, a lack of um, a clear explanation, let's say, how you got into this and why you're doing this and why you and your colleagues are be believe that this is a, a, a reason to... Um, a reason to continue working on it. like what excites you about this because I feel a little bit like there's a I'm sorry if I, I'm getting reading this wrong but I feel like there's a little bit of a, of a of a vacuum in terms of explaining why you're excited about this is that does that make sense yeah I think that question makes sense but come back but to I, I just want to understand what it is that 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 gets you working on this and, and why it is that this is the thing you're doing okay so I'll answer that personally so one of the things I'm particularly interested in is being able to reduce the amount of bugs that find their way out into production software, reduce the, make, make it slightly more secure so it's harder to attack, but make that tool chain easy so it's easy for developers to actually go do that. 
rather than having to deploy all this stuff everywhere. And one of the particular things I care about is related to Internet of Things. Because it's not just about toasters and fancy fridges and washing machines. It's going to be embedded devices in us. So the pacemaker example, um, I once asked before I got started in Unicode, what software runs on a pacemaker? How is that software written? How is it tested? Is it open? Can I go see it? And I don't really know the I, I should have looked at the answer, but I don't really know. And we actually did have a presentation on that recently, and the answer was pretty grim. You can look it up in our archives. We'll talk about it after. Okay. So Unicorns represent a way of building for those kinds of environments where, especially if you build using the language specific ones, where you can benefit from all the, the, the years of research into fixing problems. So memory safe, uh, memory safe languages, static typing, all those things can help reduce the amount of bugs we actually ship. And with the Unicorn approach, you actually reduce the amount of code you end up shipping. So deploying stuff to devices like that ends up making them um, slightly more secure, just better, better software out there. One of the other things I'm particularly interested in, as well as those devices that are going to be embedded in us, is um, essentially the area of personal data. If I wanted to run my own infrastructure, if I wanted to run my own email server, let's say, or my own uh, contact syncing or calendar synchronization stuff, I could run that myself now, but then I'm on the hook for security patches and updating it and dealing with this giant pile of software, most of which I don't understand or don't really care about if I want to maintain that system. If I can reduce that, if I can make it easier for me to do that, then maybe I'm more likely to go do that. So to run, run my own infrastructure on a device like this in my house, if I wanted to. That's something I would like to be able to get to. In that case, though, let's say for an email server or even a, a functioning web server that does more than just pass requests to another backend, at a certain point, aren't you going to have to draw in a similar quantity of complexity as a any other running operating system in order to do that? Not necessarily, because it depends on what I'm running. So if I only want to run a certain piece of infrastructure, then I only need to pull in the code for that infrastructure. So I don't need to worry about whether or not I have a, uh, an exploitable floppy driver somewhere in my code base, because it won't be there. I wouldn't have pulled it in. So the only things I'm exposed to are the things I've actually had to pull in. And there's, there's necessarily less code there than there would be in an operating system, in a traditional operating system. Now you could argue, what if I use one of the other stripped down OSs? And maybe that's a way forward as well. So it's, it's really good to see that happening. So it doesn't have to be just unikernels. There's this, this approach of generally stripping away stuff is a good thing. Oh, thank you. You answered this already, but related to that, um, you mentioned Mirage OS is uh, the development is done uh, for the program application side with OCaml. Uh, you have such an array of languages. How 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 does the array of available languages and unikernels fit together? How, are you restricted? Is, do you have choices in what you what could be developed on? So at the moment, for Mirage OS, it's, everything is written in a camel. So and each of the language specific unikernels, it's in that specific language. So HalVM is Haskell, Erlang is Ling, Include OS is C++ or C. One of the things we would like to be able to do, and one of the things we're working on from Mirage OS, is the ability to talk using C. So we have a project called C types, and you can create things called inverted stubs, where essentially you can take uh, an a camel library and then expose it as, I'm actually talking, answering your question the other way around, you can actually expose it using C interfaces, so you can call it, call a, an a camel library from somewhere else. But you can then also other bits of code from other languages if they have a way of talking through C. I'm kind of waffling here, but that's, that's probably something we can talk about afterwards. So at the moment, the short answer is, if you use Mirage OS, you're writing in a camel. But as work progresses, you should be able to talk to other libraries from other bits of the ecosystem if there's a way of talking through C. Does that make sense? Yeah, a little bit, thank you. So the library I'm specifically talking about is C types. So if anyone wants to go look that up to get a better explanation. Homework, thank you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so I have a pretty simplistic understanding of this, and you've explained this greatly to me that I can understand what I do understand. Uh, I guess my question for you is, like, I saw the cubby with the game app on it, and um, I'm thinking, what is your vision? Like, where do you see this going? Because um, 
stress that it is not an operating system. We're not deploying mini operating systems or anything like that. So like, how far could someone take this in your vision? Because obviously like on a fridge or a washing machine, you have like a web browser and maybe a temperature app or something like that. But how far or complex do you think it can get before it's interpreted as like an iOS where you have an interface with a bunch of widgets? I would say, so just to paraphrase the question is, how big do the, could you, these things end up getting when you start shoving more stuff into them? X without it becoming an actual OS. Question, I don't know, we haven't actually, I don't think we've actually tried to do a whole bunch of stuff with it because that's not the, the purpose of it. So if we're trying to shove more stuff into it, uh, I think what we'd end up trying to do is building separate Unikernel for different components of a service. That's why Unikernels are useful for microservices. So it's little small things that do one job rather than trying to have a Unikernel that does a, a vast array of things. At that point, you're in the realm of a more of a general purpose operating system. Maybe you should be using that instead. I was just trying to think because when you have like all these Internet of Thing devices, um, like even like the Nest uh, thermostats, like you can do more than just set the temperature on your on your HVAC system. You know, you can more than that. So I'm like, all right, that's more than one application for that one device. So is it one application per device or do you see multiple applications per single device? I have multiple applications for a single device, but they could each be running a separate unikernel and communicating with each other. So one of the things I, I didn't talk about is you could deploy multiple unikernels on a, on a Zen host. We could do that now, I think. Well, well, think about it as microservices. An application is no longer one little service anymore. An application is now a collection of microservices. So the thing that, der that delivers the value to the end user is maybe 10 different microservices all doing something together. So the same approach could apply to unikernels, where you have a collection of unikernels, each doing a specific thing, but then provide some value. So the application is long no longer one little thing. It's a, it's a behavior. It's a thing that emerges from having all of these things work. The fact that they're all separate means it's easy to swap them out or to, to tweak one of them. The same as it is with, same as it's promised to be with microservices. Taking an OS and making it modular and just taking the stuff that you want from the OS to get certain functions done, like creating your own Swiss Army knife with them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a few questions which are not so related. Uh, following up the previous question, why did you, uh, maybe just give both questions and you'll give all the answers. Why did you select Camel? Oh, Camel is your language for Mirage OS. Uh, number two, you mentioned that um, containers and unikernels are continuum. We're using the term loosely. It looks like it was either one or the other. Uh, is it possible to have something in between? Um, and the uh, other question is, do you always have to have some sort of hypervisor that the unikernel runs on top of, or can it ever run on bare metal? I'll take the last one first. Yes, you can run it on bare metal. Um, if you have the device drivers to, to do that, so that's possible. And the continuum question, yes, things may appear in between. So I, I use the example of a continuum to, to show that these aren't competing technologies. There's just um, an array of things that are out there, and these, the, that's how those two things sit. So your, your diagram showed you know, the containers run on top of a kernel, which runs on top of the hypervisor, whereas the unikernels run directly on top of the hypervisor. So if there's a kernel in between, it would seem that it's either there or it's not there. So that's why I was confused. Uh, oh, so we, when I say continuum, so say for example, on one side of that you have something like Ubuntu that you're running, but then somewhere in between maybe you have Alpine Linux or something much, much smaller, much more stripped down kernel instead. So it's that kind of continuum that I'm meaning. So you end up stripping away things, stripping away, stripping away, and ultimately you end up with something that's like a unikernel where there isn't anything. Huh. So the kernel can be a very different sizes. Yeah. Okay. And why a camel? So yes. a camel is, has been around for about 20 years. There's lots of a camel people in the room. Raise your hands. All these people can also help answer that question. And essentially, it's a strongly statically typed language. It's very pragmatic, so you can you write in a functional style. You can also write an imperative style. And the, the team working on it has a lot of experience with it. So there's lots of benefits that we get from just the language itself that firstly remove a whole slew of bugs, allow us to architect things in a certain way, and make things just easier to refactor once, once code is written in a certain way. So there's lots of benefits to using a camel. There is. There is um, text on unikernel.org, one of the, the research papers that actually goes into more detail about why that, why that language. Hi. I was wondering if you can share with us how well suited you think that um, 
these uh, unique kernels are for networking applications. I'm talking about something like a firewall. Excellent. That's one of the first. <laughs> that's one of the first things. That, one of the first things that um, has been built that's actually being used on a uh, machine is a firewall, a unikernel firewall that is sitting on Zen as part of Cubes OS. Is anyone familiar with Cubes OS? Okay, so that there's a unikernel firewall written. There's a blog post, really good blog post by Thomas Leonard, who's one of the the core team of Mirage, and he built a unikernel firewall and then is deploying it on his machine, on his day-to-day -day machine. So it's actually really, really good for things for th things like that, and it's really good for those things. So DNS server is something we've built. So we've got a DNS server in about two, it's about 200 kilobytes that works just as well as Bind 9, I think it is. So that's listed in the one of the papers. It's also on unicorn.org slash resources has a bunch of papers. Uh, the second paper linked there has information on that particular unicorn. So you can get these things to be really small, but just as efficient. So it is actually quite good for things like that right now. Um, so if we get to a stage where we have, you know, a consolidation of unikernels that are all single purpose that build up more complex application, is there any sort of like uh, redundant checks to see this unikernel over here in this, you know, virtual machine or this, this uh, is already using this dependency? Here references that same dependency. So is there like a shared layer, some sort of architect or orchestrator behind it? Or are we getting into the territory of like a operating system at that point? I'm not. What, so. Well, so like shared dependencies across different unit kernels. Yeah. Okay, then I guess that answers that right there. That would be a kernel feature. Very interesting, but the question I really have is, is there anything to orchestrate it? Large networks perform process. High performance computing applications. Uh, see any kind of orchestration tool or targeted control tools that will act like Swarm and Docker do, where you can orchestrate the payload across various unikernel systems sitting on top of a hypervisor? Excellent question, and I would say, wouldn't it be awesome if the existing tools could just do that? <laughs> so maybe we should work on that. Because um, So what you're describing is something we need to work on, and tools already exist, so how much work is it to make those tools work with this kind of technology? And that's one of the things that we're, we're actually working towards, as in make this technology, make unikernels much, much easier to use. Tool chains matter. Practical. Most of have are the kind of things where they're like cross compilers. You build it here and then you can move it over there, except it's extracted over the hypervisor so it's transportable. So way kind of like the whole Java uh, promise, right? Transportability because it's abstracted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the ability to... I don't really know how to answer that one. Yeah. In addition, you're still targeting the binary. I mean, you still have to target the platform, right? This isn't giving you an independent, uh, an emulator or anything else like that, is it? I mean, it doesn't seem like that's what you're presenting. So at the moment, we when we target to Zen, is wherever Zen runs, the unikernel is going to run. So. Sure, and I mean, from a perspective, reducing the footprint of things that are attackable and things you have to maintain is always and is, is that there's an opportunity here where you can take code and perhaps produce a distributed database across the surface of multiple ARM processors and then plug and plug and optimize various parts of it in flight if you can do it in a more real-time way as opposed to complete it into a compile curve, right? Because right now it's very static. It builds into a very static environment. It's, it's great for just targeting an embedded system. But if you could take that same shortened stack and you know approach individual tasks in say a very large database system, you could build a distributed database across multiple processors and then optimize each individual query flow through them. That's really interesting. But if all those processes are the same, then 
then it would not just work, as in right now. So what's, diff what's the difference across all those different? Well, those you're building something lines. very static. So if you could predictively determine what the target looked like, yes, you could do it right now with what you have. But in most cases, well, the whole problem with databases is that you build a schema, and the schema has, has to change over time because people change applications, people change their desired results. Their expectations of what it's sitting on top of it changes. So the point is, is if you had smaller systems that were able to abstract the problem into the equivalent of like microservices, you could construct a database that's essentially tuned in flight for changes in schema, changes in query load, and things like that. Can I get a clarification? You mentioned when Zen is the target, but but Zen is still sitting on top of a particular ABI, right? You're you're not providing a target. There isn't a target provided here that's independent of the hardware. Is there? So Zen has. Does Zen have a fully virtualized mode? I've only ever seen it emulating the basically providing interposition of certain calls to provide a para virtualization. Yeah, it's para virtualization that we're. That's the particular feature that we're using. So there is DOM zero, where most of the other pieces live. So that's still a Linux stack. So that's how we, that's where essentially where we get the drivers from. So that's why targeting Zen actually is useful for us because Zen is then a stable, uh, stable um, interface to target. Right, but if I want to target an ARM sixty four versus an x eighty six sixty four, I have a separate compilation target still, right? Which the tool chain that we have will take care of for you. But that's I just want to make sure it's a different artifact for the platform. It's not like the JVM where you have a bytecode interpreter that's going to take it and translate it down into okay. the specific machine code. Okay. Yeah. Is that it? Is everyone? Oh no, more. What about the bugging? So, the question was, what about debugging? So this goes back to an earlier earlier thing I mentioned, which is when you're developing these. Uh, Technology. When you're developing your application, all the normal tools are still available to you. So if you're using a camel, whatever the tools are that you're working with, what you normally work with, they're still there. So you're but talking not about the in production. It's just sure, Zen kernel. Sure, like, how still, do you debug it? Sure. Well, no one really, how many people really debug in production? I'm curious. Show of hands, please. One. I get it. it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, not all the time. Shit not all the but time, then, but oh but my God, is, you know, yes. The question is then how you then choose to deal with it. So you can then say, right, I'm going to take this thing that broke, go off to an isolated environment, and then try it again and say, does it break the same way? And can I add extra things to this to see, can I record more things from it? Can I make it more, get more verbose logs out of it? Can I attach something to it to see what's going on? So debugging is definitely a thing, and we do need more tools. And some tools already work. Some tools, we, we, need, um, we need more of them. But so the question of debugging is, first, you build your application normally, as you normally would with, with a camel code, in the case of Mirage OS. Then you compile it down and deploy it. And then when something goes wrong, you, sh you should be capturing logs from that as to what's going wrong. And if it is still going wrong, take it off to a separate environment because it, it doesn't belong in production. Clearly, it's not working. And then go test it and then hit it with a hammer, add more things to it, take things away, and understand how things are working. And also, if you have access to the hypervisor that it's running on, in our case, then you can have other tools to figure out what's going on. So you can do profile. Did that actually answer your question? This question comes up all the time. <laughs> One more the, question. The environment is not necessarily different to the way you work with containers at the moment, because if people are also trying to strip away what's in a container, you're also taking away a bunch of the other tooling. So when you want to understand what's going on, you have to have access to other bits of the system or put things into the image to get more information out. But what you're describing isn't necessarily specific to Unikernels. It's, ge it's generally part of the whole microservices trend is we need to have methods and tools and techniques and approaches to help debug stuff when basically shit breaks. Um, and what about uh, scheduling of various resources and handling that and having the ability to configure either live or statically what your I.O. will be or what your time slices will be for particular tasks within the, uh, within the unikernel? I think that's handled by Zen in our case. I don't think that's something that, um, that we do within the unikernel. The unikernel is running one thing. So if you have a flood of data coming in and a flood of data going out, how do you how do you handle prioritizing, coalescing, anything like that within the application? Is there any help for that, or is there any ability to determine when that's happening, or is it all? Good because, because the end, end target, you said, was a lot of the time embeddable devices, things that probably have 
restricted resources and. Okay, so ultimately, um, I should have phrased this perhaps more carefully. Ultimately, we think one of the useful cases is embeddable targets, but what we're actually deploying to now, for the, mo the majority of the deployments, are actually on top of the hypervisor. So uh, the embedded stuff is something we know we can do and we want to get to, but there aren't necessarily that many deployments. So the kind of thing you're asking is something we'll have to get to. And there may well be work already that I'm not fully up to speed with. All right, back to the other side here. Any more questions? All right, uh, is there any chance, I, I asked you last minute, do you think you have a few, uh, a few trivia questions you'd want to throw out there and see how people respond to it? Uh, couldn't think of anything. Couldn't think of anything. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Okay. Um, well, I know, but, but we, we, if we have questions, we have answers. Well, well I'll send you t-shirts. I'll send you a Docker t-shirt. There you go. We can have one, one question, one t-shirt. How's that sound? I have three. Okay, three questions. And th okay, so the stakes are high again. Do you have questions now? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? I'm, I'll provide t-shirts. <laughs> we need questions. Um, Spiros, do you a question, have... I'll also give you a t-shirt. <laughs> okay, Spiros, do you have any questions that you want to ask of the audience? Since you, I know you spent a little time helping with this presentation earlier, maybe. Come on up, come on up. You, well, yeah, I just said, yeah, come Because I just asked you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, okay. All right, now, one t-shirt. I now have another trivia question. All right. Where was the TLS stack written? Where in the world? <laughs> don't, don't call out your answers. There's a t-shirt at stake here. Raise your hand if you'd like to... Uh... I will, if failing it, I will accept continent. <laughs> okay, you are... Nope. Okay, and you sir in the back? Morocco? Ooh, yes. <laughs> All right, that's two t-shirts. We'll have to get, we'll have to get uh, Amir to get your contact info later. Okay, do we have a third? There's a place called Mir Left. All right. Third t-shirt. Oh, uh, what's the name of the library that provides... Um... Uh, I saw your hand go up in the middle. Yes. All right, there's three t-shirts, three people who need to come up and yes, come. talk. Talk to uh, talk to Amir about uh, getting Docker Docker shirts, or do you have Mirage shirts? Uh, Docker shirts. Okay, Docker <laughs> probably has a lot more shirts. I'm just you know just want to make sure we set expectations here. All right, so we're heading to Jake's, right? That's over Jake's Saloon over on Seventh Avenue on the other side of Seventh Avenue and Fort and Twenty uh, Third Street, and uh, we'll be heading over there uh, in groups, or you can make it there on your own. There's some reserved space in the back. Amir uh, will be joining us. You okay. can ask him your questions, maybe get some clarifications, tell him stories. Thank you very much. We will see uh, see you soon.